Pamile i Africa. Pamile, 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 Pamile i Africa. A warm welcome to you all. We are delighted, SDCDC, to be part of this process. It's a process that we have been part of on the sideline um, and it's our dream. We've been around for almost 50 years now, TCDC is around. Tony Blair said, Africa is a scar on the conscience of humanity. We gather here today to say, in fact, Africa is the home of humanity. We gather here to say that Africa is not a poor continent. That Africa is one of the richest continents on this planet, but it has been impoverished by slavery, colonialism, and ongoing injustice. And we are here to claim back Africa for all the peoples that live on it. We have five collective expectations from this meeting. Nous avons dans un ensemble de cinq attentes. We want to understand the African Civil Society Initiative better. Nous voulons mieux comprendre l'initiative de la société civile africaine. We want to create a shared vision and a strategy for the continent. Nous voulons créer une vision partagée et des stratégies pour le continent. And we want to create a roadmap for how we will get there. Et nous voudrions élaborer eh, un plan pour aller là où nous allons. We also want to create opportunities to network and to share among ourselves. Et nous voulons aussi créer des opportunités pour un réseautage entre nous. And lastly, we want to create opportunities to express solidarity with each other. Et enfin, nous voulons créer des opportunités pour exprimer la solidarité en nos sein. And so we are here today partly to say we are not prepared to adjust ourselves to the level of corruption that we see on our continent. We are here to say that we are not willing to adjust to the levels of gender inequality that exist. We are we are not willing to adjust to the fact, like in my country, for example, where my president will think it's acceptable to spend 250 million rands on his house when our majority, when large numbers of our people do not have a small basic house to live in. We also are saying, and if I can say this very strongly with deep hurt in my heart, we are not prepared to adjust to the fact that our political leaders say things and do things that will allow the kind of xenophobic violence that we saw in South Africa against our brothers and sisters from other parts of the continent, especially given that a country like South Africa would not have been free were it not for the solidarity and support that we got from brothers and sisters all over the continent. So for example, when we're thinking about the critical need of social, economic, and political integration on our continent, uh, we should, for example, be saying if Europe can have a Euro, why can't Africa have an Afro? And I'm not talking about the ESTA. Uh, if, if Europe can organize itself that people can travel from one country to the other without the kinds of ridiculous restrictions that we have on this continent in terms of travel, why can't we do it? It's a question of political will and it's a question of imagination. So with that vision in mind, in October 2015, a group of civil society networks gathered here at this very place and started the dream of trying to unite civil society across the continent.
So, the question you've got to ask yourself today as civil society, what are we doing today that will create a future with hope for those generations coming after us? What do we have to do today? And that's a big question. Because at the core of it is about peace. How do you win peace? You know, you've got to organize yourself. You've got to be fearless in how you win the support of people and people feel that they will defend the peace. Because we can never form an army. A community can only defend itself if it believes in itself. We are seeing over the last 10 years a shrinking of democratic space in our countries. And we are specifically seeing curtailments to freedom of assembly, freedom of association, and freedom of expression, three of the critical human rights that all civil society organizations need to be able to do the work. We had several people talking about civil society having a space to function, but I feel from my opinion that there are different civil society organizations but however I feel like there is no coordination among them. So how do you want to have a space when you are not coordinated? You have different people doing, running different agendas and uh, I don't feel like there is going to make an impact if you don't work in coordination. My point is, is indeed Africa is rising. And indeed, Africa is uniting. But Africa is uniting around the wrong policies. And uh, once you rise or unite around the wrong policies, you transform the mode of production. And who now controls the production base of Africa? And then that also takes us to distribution. Because it is the one who controls uh, the mode of production which increasingly is not our government, but are not also not our people, uh, but multinationals, then certainly the distribution will no more lie in the hands of our government to uh, prop up uh, poverty areas. Can African problems be addressed in a long frame manner? That is always, you know, what our donors are always saying, you know, uh, I want to see this in your log frame, this and that. And in that way, you cannot be able to address long-term problems if you have a, a log frame that is determining what you have to do. And I think that is a challenge for civil society. So I want to propose that gender inequality be framed around women's rights and freedom so that in as much as we can have the women in those decision-making spaces, we then do not get blind on the need for us to continuously provide a conducive environment for them to represent and also for us to provide a supportive system. Currently, I'm working on what I would call the National Anger Index, so that people will measure how people are angry with the issues that are affecting them. Rather than talk about the GDP and what are you, how are the people getting angry and bitter with the issues that are affecting them? Mais moi, j'aimerais qu'on parle d'équité et de justice sociale, parce que ça pose beaucoup de problèmes chez moi. Equity and justice social. When we talk, when when we talk about gender inequality, it will cover the poverty that is caused by the lack of uh, maybe rights amongst the women in the poor areas. But when you talk about poverty in general in the African context, I feel like it should go more with the political issue. Electoral injustices is an important thing for Africa. You find in most of the countries, every time either just before elections there is grand corruption. Just after elections, there is grand corruption, and then of course there is ethnic wars and everything else that comes with it. So we need, as a continent, to, discuss, to address the issue of electoral injustices, which carries a lot of baggage with it. Eunice from Libya, yeah. So I think in my opinion, that's uh, it's a very trendy topic, and uh, we shall focus on it. It's uh, youth, peace and security. It's a very trendy uh, Thing. And if we want to move forward in this initiative, we have to borrow it on the table and think about it so deeply. Yeah. Uh, if Af Africans rising would actually focus on governance, democratic governance, then those other issues would actually be addressed. Because uh, if it is uh, inequalities, 
then why are there inequalities? It's because of uh, poor governance. Religion has been used to pacify Africans. We are told that we need to pray and we have to pray our problems away and we have to do these things. And there's nothing wrong with prayer, but I think prayer has been used as an excuse to rule over us. It has been used as an excuse to postpone our struggle and to not to fight because at all, it's God's will, it's God's will. And you know, it's never God's will for anyone to be poor. If it's God's will for everyone to be poor, then the president should be living in, a, in the slums, like the majority of the citizens. And so, while well, I have nothing against Christians and Muslims praying, what I'm saying is, you need to walk your prayers, because we pray more and work less. And prayer without action, prayer without doing the right thing, is useless. So what is different about this initiative? What is different? It's not as if some of us, me included, have not been, and many people I see in this audience, I know, have worked very hard at different moments in our history to organize civil society across the continent. It's not as if we didn't try before. We have tried. Sometimes we had a limited impact. Sometimes we had no impact. Uh, sometimes we had big impact. But I want to focus now on what is different about what we try to do. So, for one, most of what we call civil society networks in the continent were largely actually NGO networks. Right? Civil society, if it is to rise to its full potential, must include all parts of civil society. And that is why it is fantastic that at the founding meeting that happened here at TCDC, that we had the African Trade Union Congress as one of the founding members. We had the African Religious Leaders Council, which is part of it. And we are now trying very hard to ensure that we get cultural artists, progressive media, and importantly, our brothers and sisters in the African diaspora. Um, what I've been most excited about was meeting with African civil society. Um, because as a member of the diaspora, um, it's important to continue to feel that you're connecting to a wider movement. We often speak on behalf of Africa abroad, but to then kind of be refreshed and challenged anew by people on the continent and the challenges they're facing kind of re reinvigorates us in the work that we do abroad. So sometimes, don't start with the big picture. Start something small. Everything starts with a few people doing something small. Imagine if millions of people did little small things, what a big thing we will produce. So sometimes, don't try to be over ambitious. Start where you are. Start small. Spend a lot of time. <coughs> be patient. Listen to people. Work with people. And that's the organizing narrative I would like to see in this movement we are trying to build. Otherwise, we will re replicate those type of civil society that doesn't, is not trusted by the people anyway. We have to show by how we work that we are different to those that today have lost the trust of our people. Um, there's this, this whole momentum of the initiative. It's, it's very timely and very progressive. And one thing that stands out for me most is the involvement of young people in the whole discourse, in the whole narrative, in the whole African rising um, um, issue. So um, for the past and uh, since yesterday, I've been seeing um, the holistic um, approach and the full engagement of all um, stakeholders, partners, as well as everybody, especially the young people. Like I was told, um, about 50% of the participants are young people, which is very progressive and very promising. I feel so much inspired by this whole conference. You know, when I was walking around, I saw these posters around. One of them which says, alone I am nothing, but together we can create a change, something like that. For me, I strongly believe in that, and I go a long way, because with all the experience that have been shared, during our group sessions, during the session we had last night, you know, I become more inspired than ever before. You know, doing our own things at, you know, country level, you will not know the challenges faced by other Africans in their own country, except you come together, except you, you join them and be part of a movement like this. L'initiative pour moi est d'abord la mise en réseau. Et cette mise en réseau permet à chacun d'entre nous de tisser des liens avec d'autres personnes qui partagent les mêmes visions, les mêmes avis et les mêmes opinions par rapport à l'Afrique de demain. 
Et cette Afrique de demain nous appartient et c'est maintenant qu'il nous faut la construire. The questions that we are trying to answer in our separate geographies are essentially questions about power and structures. And so we can't just be trying to put plasters on the wounds anymore. We need to be really dealing with the structural issues. And that requires us to have collective power. And for too long we have been singing from the colonial hymn sheet which is we are this country, we are that country, we are English speaking, we are Francophone or Portuguese or Arabic. To finally see ourselves again as African, to see what value each African country contributes and how we can learn from each other so that we break those colonial relationships of my country and my colonial, you know, relationship and start to say what lessons do I can I learn first and foremost from other Africans. If this platform can do that, I think already we're much stronger in, in our efforts. We gather here in a spirit of compassion, love for our continent and our peoples and the natural resources that we have, and a commitment to actually rise above the levels of injustice that we actually, that our people experience. We refuse to accept that the Africa that we have today is the best that we as Africans can create for ourselves. We refuse and we will rise against them. I think my short term um, expectation is how do we strengthen collaborations instead of always um, repetitive of issues and people starting things that have already been started? How do we strengthen that collaboration and working together and all of that? But also, how do we define a long term vision? Because um, civil society again has been a problem, has, has a problem with being reactionary instead of proactive. How do we stop being reactionary to, to, to government? and start organizing ourselves around what the people on the ground really need and grassroots movements and things like that. Africans rising for peace, justice and sustainable development. Africans rising!